Good evening. I am Arachna the Spider People, your hostess with the mostess. And welcome to Beware Theatre, because this Beware you're gonna see some really bad movies. We've got vampires, aliens, werewolves, monsters, and of course, the undead. So take a load off, pull up a couch, and fasten your seatbelt. It's gonna be a creepy night. 1954 was a banner year for science fiction movies like Godzilla and Them and Creature from the Black Lagoon. It was also the year that one of the lamest, worst, and most stupidest sci-fi movies was made, Killers from Space. It was produced and directed by Billy Wilder's less talented brother, Lee Wilder, had a lackluster script by Billy Wilder's less talented son, Miles Wilder, and it starred Peter Graves before he had, well, a real acting career. Killers from Space is about a bunch of bug-eyed aliens who want to use the power from an A-bomb blast to grow gigantic bugs and reptiles in order to eat all the humans on the world so they can inhabit the world. But then, they're stopped by a nuclear scientist with a slide rule. You heard that right, folks. Stupid, stupid, stupid. And like I said, there's big eyeballs, big bugs, lots and lots of stock footage of A-bomb blasts and airplanes and helicopters and bugs and other weird things. And there's this operation that looks like it's being done with a blowtorch, plus a really, really long flashback. So because this movie is so bad it's good, we're going to watch it. Killers from Space. Soledad Platz, Nevada. The time, 6.15 a.m. The climax of arduous planning. Operation A-bomb test underway. Detonation minus two minutes. Military personnel from Buck Private to top ranking brass. Men from research and news services move into position. The bomb carrying plane makes its initial run. Radar with eyes that never sleep. Special equipment go into operation. All orders are carried out with split second precision. Warning is given to all commercial aircraft to stay out of the test area. Detonation minus 70 seconds. Planes take to the air, carrying sensitive instruments and nuclear scientists, ready to record the radioactivity from the closest possible vantage point. Detonation minus 40 seconds. The bomb carrying plane nears the target. Tension mounts as all members of the flight crew anticipate the task to pinpoint the bomb on a tiny circle of Earth below. Now the plane wings its way toward ground zero. Warning signal is sounded. All observers prepare for the blinding flash of the bomb. Command of the plane is given to the bombardier. Ground zero dead ahead. The key man now goes into action. Bomb bay doors open. Detonation minus 10 seconds. Nine, eight, seven, six, Five, four, three, two, one, zero. And this is the beginning.
patrol from Tar Baby 2. Over. Go ahead, Tar Baby 2. We're circling ground zero at radius of 7.5 miles. Altitude 1, 5, 0, 0, 0 feet. Airspeed 4, 5, 0. Stand by. Roger and over. She's all yours. This is Dr. Martin. Here are the readings. 0.378 negative, second indicator. 1.08 negative, radiation 0.4. Over. Roger, proceed according to plan. We'll go and up. Take her in closer. Okay, Dr. Martin. from the center of the column. The radiation was too strong. What's that thing shining below? Looks like a fireball. You better check. Dr. Martin. Dr. Martin, we're in trouble. Pull out. Come in, Tar Baby 2. Come in, Tar Baby 2. We've lost contact, sir. Baker 2, sir. Yes, sir. All patrol craft in test area. This is a May Day. Repeat, this is a May Day. Proceed to segment Baker 17. Search for Tar Baby 2. Star Baby 7. Wreckage sighted southwest corner Soledad Flats. Ship appears completely demolished. No sign of survivors. Over. Roger, Tar Baby 7. Circle wreckage at 1000 feet until arrival of helicopter rescue unit. mind coming into my office right away, please? Thank you. As I was saying, our search planes found the wreckage of your husband's plane, Mrs. Martin. A rescue crew was sent out, but... But they must have reached the wreckage hours ago. Why can't they find him? I honestly don't know, Mrs. Martin. Yes, come in. Helen. Kurt. Colonel Banks, isn't there any hope? I'm afraid not, Mrs. Martin. <laughs> they found the pilot dead in the wreckage. And according to all reports, no one could have bailed out. I'm terribly sorry, Mrs. Martin. Martin, you're all, are you all right? I... I am, yes. It's Dr. Martin. Call the base hospital. <sighs> all right, get up now.
Well, everything seems all right. Except, can't you recall anything that happened from the time your plane crashed until... I remember the controls froze. The next thing I saw was the main gate of the base. Your plane was completely demolished. The pilot burned to death. And you show up the picture of health. Are you sure you weren't driven here? Positive. You don't remember where you got this? Mm -mm. You know, your medical chart shows no indication of any scars on your body. I must have got it in a crash. Uh, now, this was surgery. A very skillful incision. I've never had an operation. Yeah, that's what I don't understand. Mr. Briggs. Colonel Banks. How are you, Mr. Briggs? Fine, how are you? Fine. I see the FBI doesn't waste much time. Well, uh, not if we can help it, Colonel. Oh, you know our base surgeon, Major Clift? Sure. How have you been, Major? How do you do? Uh, well, I guess you gentlemen have business to discuss. Oh, no, no. This won't take a minute. Sit down. <laughs> Sit down, will you please, gentlemen? Cigarette. Oh, thank you. I understand you've already talked with Dr. Martin. I just left him. You know, our colonel, um, according to my files, Dr. Martin is just about the key man on this nuclear project. Yes, along with Dr. Kruger, he is. Mm -hmm. Well, I know they're both good friends and, uh, well, both have knowledge and access to top secret information. Well, that's very true, but that's no reason to suspect that oh, they... Oh, we can, uh, we can suspect anything, Colonel. Until Dr. Martin accounts for every minute from the time of the crash. The shock must have caused a mental block. His mind doesn't want to remember the details, the origin of the scar on his chest, how he got back to the base under his own power. Did you ever stop to think that perhaps this Dr. Martin isn't really the Dr. Martin? What are you getting at? What I mean is that uh, this man could be an imposter. come through, huh? They do check. That's what I've been waiting for. Thanks. Get me Colonel Banks at the base, please. No, no, I'll wait. Oh, yes, Mr. Briggs. Any news on the line you were getting on Dr. Martin? Just heard from Washington. Well, I was wrong. This is our man, all right. His prints and description check right down the line. Now, here's what I suggest you do. But you said in excellent physical condition, yet you're keeping him in the base hospital. Why? Mrs. Martin, you must realize that your husband is engaged in a highly secret work. If this experience had, well, affected his mind... Are you trying to tell me that Doug is... No, no, no. It's nothing serious, Mrs. Martin. His reflexes are excellent. Except for that one lapse of memory, his mind is perfectly clear. Isn't that natural under the circumstances? Yes. Except for the question of the scar on his chest. I know he didn't have it before the crash. Well, I'm sure he didn't, Mrs. Martin. But you see, it would be impossible for a wound of this size to have healed so quickly and without medical attention. Well, you can't keep him here indefinitely. We don't intend to. Uh, we asked you to come down here because we've decided to let you take him home, provided you can keep him quiet and he gets in the press. I understand. Now we'll just have to take that vacation he's been wanting for so long. Vacation? To watch him, you'd think you'd never heard of one. Yes, he must have asked me a hundred times when the next test was scheduled. He's anxious to take his own readings again. Well, he did have a key part in the planning of these projects. Well, is there anything he should or shouldn't be allowed to do? No. Except, he does need diversion. Anything that won't upset or excite him. I see. Movies, bridge, drives, things like that. Well, you're the doctor now. Just see that he gets plenty of rest. Thank you. Goodbye, Colonel. Goodbye. See you later, Major.
Doug, what's the matter? I can't sleep. What time is it? After three. I think I'll get myself a glass of milk. I can't give out information to anyone. No, sir, it won't do you any good to come down. All right, we'll see about that. I'm going to get out to the base right away. Alan, don't you agree with me? I've spent months preparing for this series of tests, and no sergeant is going to push me around now. Well, aren't you going to say anything? No. Look, I know they're ready for another test, and I should be there. Can't you understand that they don't want you wrong for your own good? I don't need their sympathy. There's nothing wrong with me. Then why are you acting this way? You're all on edge. If you don't slow down, I don't know what's going to happen. You really believe that, don't you? Look, Doug, if you won't take it easy for your own sake, please, do it for mine. You know, after watching the stock footage of the military exercises that dropped the atom bomb test, a couple things occurred to me. Number one, we hadn't the slightest clue how dangerous radioactivity was back then. And number two, it looks like this movie scrounged up every scrap of stock footage it could find from the Manhattan Project and World War II and animals and other things. And number three, it was kind of obvious who the president of the United States was at that time because his picture on the wall got more screen time than some of the actors. Now, Dr. Doug Martin was flying through and studying the cloud left after the atomic bomb blast, which is not a good idea, folks. Don't do this at home. When he sees a flashing light on ground zero, and then his plane goes out of control and it crashes. And then later, and they don't say how much later, he staggers back to the base, but he's unhurt. He has this big L-shaped scar over where his heart is, and he can't remember what happened. And then this FBI guy shows up, and he says Dr. Martin is an imposter, and he's a spy. Probably because back then it was the McCarthy era, and the FBI was constantly looking for Ruski spies trying to steal nuclear secrets. But Dr. Martin's fingerprints prove that he's himself, although he wasn't really feeling like himself because, well, he kept hallucinating these gigantic eyeballs and he couldn't sleep. Plus, they took him off the project. Ah, what deadly? Who was the president in 1954? What? He starred in this movie, Eisenhower. state, you're not considered a very good security risk. Me? A security risk? My present state? What's the matter with me? How long am I to be considered? Only temporarily. The results of the test will be available for your study when you return to work. I am ready, Colonel. 
To us, you're still a very sick man. My advice to you is to go home and relax, as you were ordered. Relax, relax. And if I don't? Then you'll be confined to the base hospital till you change your mind. Now, what's it going to be? Oh, Dr. Martin. I didn't expect you back so soon. Haven't you heard? I'm a metal case. Can't even be trusted with my own work. Ah! I'm going to go berserk at any minute. Colonel Banks will fill you in on the details. Ah, don't, don't tell me. Let me see. You're, uh... I know, I know. You're Miss uh, Vincent, the secretary I share with... Uh, oh, hmm. Doctor, you can't be serious. Uh, there was no one in your office, so I thought you wouldn't mind. Oh, that's all right. It's all right. As far as I'm concerned, you can take the rest of the day off. Are you sure? Mm -hmm. No, I don't really belong here. I just, uh, just came in to pick up a few personal things from my desk. Goodbye. Goodbye. Checked out. Yeah, about 20 minutes ago. Okay. Sorry to keep you waiting, Doctor. That's all right. Okay, Doctor. Will you sign out, please? We'll post a couple of men outside of Dr. Kruger's office. Give me Colonel Banks at the Officers Club. Thank you, Doctor. Good night. Good evening, Dr. Kruger. Yes? My name's Briggs. I'm from the FBI. Briggs. Briggs. Of course. I've heard of you. <laughs> I wonder if you'd mind uh, returning to your office with me. Well, what seems to be the trouble? Oh, just a few things we'd like to straighten out. 
Concerns me? Well, I'm afraid so, Doctor. And take your own car if you like. I'll meet you there. All right, I will. The papers seem to be intact. Is this all uh, classified information, Doctor? Of course. You know, according to security regulations, that vault should have been locked before you left. But I'm certain I did lock it. All right, then tell me this. Who besides yourself has access to the combination? Well, the colonel here and Dr. Martin. Dr. Martin. Huh? He was in the building this afternoon. That's right. We saw him in my office. He left around 4 o'clock on orders. He dismissed the secretary a few minutes later, but he... He didn't sign out of here until 20 minutes after you left. After I did. Well, there must be some mistake. I personally checked his office just as I was leaving, and he wasn't there. Do you always do that, Doctor? No, but Dr. Martin has been acting, well, quite strange of late. Yes, he certainly has. His wife telephoned to say that he hadn't come home as usual. I was very much concerned about it. So am I. He still hasn't shown up yet. <laughs> What kind of pipe tobacco do you use, Dr. Kruger? Me? Why, I don't smoke at all. Did you, Colonel? Cigarettes. What are you oh. driving at? That's funny. How long has Dr. Martin been using this brand of tobacco? Well, I really don't know. Why? Now, Mrs. Martin, you say you have no idea where he could be at this hour. Well, I know he's never been this late before without telephoning. Units in Sector 7, Code 4. Repeating, Code 4. Be on the lookout for two-tone coupe. License number 1W67713. Repeating, all units, Code 4. Missing, Dr. Douglas P. as in Paul Mott. Male Caucasian, 32 years of age. Height, 6 foot 3. Weight, 195 pounds. Color of hair, blonde. Color of eyes, blue. Last seen driving away. License number 1W67713. Dr. Martin. What are you doing with this? Any special reason for placing it under this rock? Your phone. Over there behind the pump. Operator, give me Crestview 95359. All units in Sector 7, Code 4. Repeating, Code 4. Be on lookout for two tone coupe. License number 1W67713. Operator, are you sure you're dialing the right number? We'll try it again, will you? It's my home. There ought to be someone there now. At junction of Highway 66 and Beach, ambulance en route. Car 17, Code 7, fourth and robbery. Suspects may be armed. Repeating, Code What's 2 to all units. Dr. Douglas P. as in Paul Martin, male Caucasian, 32 years of age, height 6 foot 3, weight 195 pounds, color of hair blonde, color of eyes blue. Missing. Dr. Douglas P. as in Paul Martin, male Caucasian. Repeating. Go to the volume. Hey, mister! Operator, give me 
the police, quick. Central. Hello, Central. This is Briggs. This is Briggs. Come in. Subject, Dr. Douglas Martin, last seen in Route 61, heading toward North Junction. Stopped at gas station, corner of Ridgewood and Mills Road. Acknowledge. Roger. Briggs, out. I guess you'll make sense now. I'll get the recorder ready. Can you hear me, Dr. Martin? Yes. Now listen to me. I want you to count backwards from 100. Do you understand? Backwards from 100. 100. 99. The eight, the seven, and the six, and the five, the four. Well, you can ask him questions now. Dr. Martin, what were you doing with the information you took from Dr. Kruger's vault? I was delivering it. Delivering it? But where? To the rocks in Soledad Flats? Yes. To Soledad Flats. And where we crashed. I was delivering it. Just as I was ordered. Who ordered you to do this, Dr. Martin? I'll tell you the whole story. I remember we were circling the atomic cloud. So there was an object. Blowing. Beneath us at Soledad Flats. We were going down to investigate. Controls jammed. Couldn't pull out. When I regained consciousness, I was on a table. Next thing I knew, they were coming at me. Strange people. Their eyes, uh, those horrible eyes. They didn't speak. I, I could see something strange and eerie pulsating in front of me. Then one of them lowered it toward my chest. It was my own heart.
I see you are quite well. You have recovered from your unfortunate accident. Who are you? A scientist, like yourself. Where do you come from? From a planet, yet unknown to you. You know my name, you speak English. We speak every language. You can't expect me to believe that. I'm getting out of here. Stay where you are. So Dr. Martin reluctantly agrees to go home, relax, and keep his nose out of the atom bomb project until he reads in the paper that they set off another A-bomb and without his scientific expertise to analyze it. Well, he rushes down to the base and he demands to be reinstated. But when they tell him to go home again because he's a security risk, what does he do? He sneaks into Dr. Kruger's office, busts into his safe, jots down some scientific mumbo jumbo, gets in his car, drives to the desert, and puts the paper under a rock. Even more surprising is FBI agent Briggs is right there to nab him. How'd Briggs know where he was going to be? Well, Dr. Martin is so angry he punches out Briggs, gets in his car, and drives off. But then he starts to hallucinate these big giant eyes, and he crashes his car. So, for the second time, Dr. Martin finds himself in the base hospital unhurt. Is this guy indestructible or what? But he's also delusional. So delusional that the base doctor gives him a shot of truth serum to try to find out what happened to him during the missing time that he had after his plane crash. So under the truth serum, Dr. Martin tells this weird story that he finds himself on this table and there are these guys with big buggy eyes hovering over him and operating on his heart outside his body. And then they put the heart back in his body and take him to their leader, who says that he had died in the plane crash, but they brought him back to life because they wanted something from him. Well, Dr. Martin freaks out. I mean, who wouldn't? And he tries to run away, but he's instantly paralyzed by this weird machine that looks like a heat lamp. And you know, folks, for many, many, many years, people have reported being abducted by aliens and experimented on. And I gotta say that this movie was apparently the first time that a movie portrayed an alien abduction by big-eyed aliens operating on somebody on a table, just like the abductees reported. Hmm. What, Billy? No, my heart is just fine, and get away from me with that blowtorch. told you that. How did you get here? Here. In our machines magnetically propelled across the electron bridge we have created. Electron bridge? You mean you come and go just like that? Without anyone ever seeing you? Our ships have been sighted on numerous occasions by your people. Then why haven't we been able to track one down? We have a warning system similar to your primitive radar. Our machines are set to change course at the mere approach of a pursuing object. Let's say I do believe you. Where are we right now? In a cavern within the upper crust of the Earth. How long have we been here? Since the beginning of your experiments in nuclear fission. What have you got to do with that? We are accumulating the energy released with each of your atomic explosions. One moment. No, I hear Peter. Peter. 
pop. No, we do it. it. Try a little. Now, you know. Yeah, you know. Never seen it. Yeah, I'll read it. Yeah, I'll seen it. Yeah, I'll be it. Charles, need a rest. What was that? A report from the monitor we sent to the surface to obtain the results of your last nuclear test. Results? They'll take days to analyze and compute. I think you will find the figures are correct. I can't believe it. Where is that man? You don't recognize the area? No. He is in the vicinity where you crashed. That rock was glowing. A normal reaction in view of the amount of radiation absorbed. You have a remarkable memory, Doctor, considering the fact that you did not survive the crash. What do you mean? The mechanism of your heart had ceased to function. It was necessary for us to revive it. You were dead. I was dead? Well, that's what they were doing. You didn't even try to help the pilot. Why did you save me? Because we had an important need of your services. Such as? Look this way, Doctor. You will understand. You are the first of your world to be looking at our solar system, the Astron. This is our planet, Astron Delta. It occupies the fourth position in relation to this, our sun. Yes, go on. During the 23rd time rotation, our sun began to die. So, during the succeeding generations, as our planet began to cool, vegetation began to disappear. Our eyes developed to this state to combat the ever-growing darkness. We were forced to migrate. You left your planet? Where? We invaded these neighboring planets. They were nearer to our sun. How many of them? All of us. Well over one billion. There were feeble attempts to stop us, but we were prepared for such contingencies. And now that our sun is about to completely expire, we must move again in order to survive. Yours is the only planet in this solar system capable of supporting our civilization. You're fantastic. Over a billion of you trying to come here to Earth. We have no alternative. We have been putting our plan to work for some time. At the proper moment, the invasion will be launched from our platforms, which are being readied in space. Nothing can stop us. Insane. This is ridiculous. You cannot find your way in or out of this cavern. Do not try to leave.
of the cage. It's horrible. What are you doing here? We are breeding our, shall I say, armies. Those carnivorous insects and animals. Look at them. Their growth is due to a change in their genes. With your next nuclear test, these animals will multiply at a rate beyond imagination. When the time comes, we will unleash them. They will spread to every continent and devour every living thing on the surface of the Earth. What good will that do you? How could you expect to survive better than we? We have provided for that. No, Doctor. Look over there. You will use their bodies to fertilize the soil. Vegetation will rise up in abundance. A new era of civilization will begin. Gamma rays? You see, Doctor. We have arranged for everything. Wait a minute. All this equipment? Our nuclear storage units. To date, we have accumulated several billion electron volts as a result of your atomic explosions. Several billion? I have... Uh... A chain reaction at this point could release enough unstable isotopes to, to create a new and powerful element. Might be impossible to control. True. An element that will never be known by your scientists. I can assure you the strength of this new element will well, be... And this is a powder keg. Could go off at any minute. I assure you, Doctor, we have everything under our complete control. What 
force could possibly be strong enough to harness the... Well, you control your whole operation by electricity. Of course, no generators, no generators. That means you're getting your power from somewhere on the surface. It must be passing through here. You have heard enough, Dr. Martin. Step inside. All right. What do you want from me? You will have access to advanced information relative to the time and strength of the forthcoming atomic tests. What about it? He will provide us with that information as soon as it is available. I see. You're afraid of an overload. You can't tap enough electricity wherever you get it from to control a strong enough charge. You are a clever man, Doctor. Perhaps too clever. And what makes you think I'll give you any information? It is the only way you can save your own life when the time comes. You will be transported to one of our platforms in space and resettled here when our operation is completed. You're asking me to sabotage the entire world, three billion people. They are doomed in any case. Well, I guess there's no alternative. I'll have to do as you say. You are lying, Doctor. Your only wish is to betray us. No. I know. Your thoughts have been recorded. Lie detector? Call it what you like. You force me to resort to other methods. I will contact our space station. You are an unwilling subject, Dr. Martin. What? Who are you? I am Vitala. You will listen and obey. No, I... You will listen to my orders and obey me. You will listen and obey. Listen and obey. You will remember nothing you have seen or heard here. Nothing but my orders which you will obey. Yes. You will obtain the data and bring it to the stone near the place where your plane was wrecked. To the stone. What have you seen or heard here? What have you seen or heard here? Nothing. Repeat my orders. I will obtain the data and bring it to the stone. Somebody say something. Don't you believe me? Kurt, you understand. These giant animals, breeding by the millions, they'll devour everything unless we stop them. Of course, Doug, we will. Colonel. Colonel, you've got to arrange to set off another bomb tonight. The strongest charge we have. They're beneath the ground with all their equipment. We can blow them to pieces. Now, wait a minute. A strong charge will overload their units. You still believe me, Colonel? Easy, Doug, easy. You think I'm crazy, all of you. Well, I'm not, do you understand? Everything I said is true. I saw it with my own eyes. Give me a hand, Doug. Now, let me go. Let me go. Steady, steady, steady. Take it easy now. Take it easy. We'll talk this whole thing over. What are you doing to me now? You just rest quietly. That's it. Martin should be along any minute now. She went for their car. What'll I tell her? Well, 
he's in a state of shock. Tell her he's resting quietly. If excuse me, I think I'd better wait for it at the information desk. Well, Dr. Martin seems to be indestructible, except for those hallucinations. Those weren't hallucinations, Colonel. Under the influence of sodium amytol, a patient loses all control of his imagination. Well, then he shouldn't be able to fabricate those stories. That's right. Major, you're not trying to tell us that everything he said was true. Look, gentlemen, I can only give you the medical facts. As for the rest, you'll have to decide for yourself. Excuse me, please. So the head bug-eyed alien, Deneb, tells Dr. Martin who his people are, where they came from, and what they want. And what they want is to be able to use all the power from the atom bomb in order to grow gigantic bugs and reptiles, in order to eat all the living things on Earth so that the aliens can leave their dying planet and inhabit the Earth. Also, there are alien spaceships circling the Earth full of aliens waiting for that to happen. Well, before Dr. Martin can burst out laughing or faint in horror, Deneb gets a communication from one of his guys on the surface. And no, folks, he was not speaking an alien language. It was the cheapest movie-making trick in the book to make you think he was speaking an alien language. They played his English dialogue backwards. And if giant bugs and reptiles eating all the humans on Earth isn't weird enough, then the aliens plan to kill them and have their rotting carcasses fertilize the Earth to make it lush again so that they can have a brand new civilization. Wait a minute. Isn't all that refertilizing and replenishing the Earth going to take like billions of years? What am I saying? This is a 1950s sci-fi movie. It doesn't have to make sense. But Dr. Martin is freaked out, and he tries to run. And he's running around these caves, and all of a sudden he sees this rear projected footage, stock footage, of bugs and reptiles fighting each other. And he's running and running, and finally he ends up back at Deneb who then shows him all of the equipment he uses to run his operation. And then Dr. Martin realizes that all of this power needs to be contained, and it can only be contained by the electricity from the power plant on the surface, and that the aliens are afraid of an overload. Oops. Deneb realizes he said too much. So he gets the supreme leader on the line and he has him hypnotize Dr. Martin and demand that he tell them when the next nuclear blast is going to be and then they send him back to the army base. Anybody else think that the supreme leader looked a lot like Denna? Maybe all aliens look alike? Anyhow, back at the base in the hospital room, you could have heard a pin drop. Nobody believed him. Well, except for maybe the doctor, because, you know, he gave him that shot of truth serum. He couldn't be imagining, right? Deadly, what are you doing with a giant dead cockroach? The garden center said it would be good fertilizer. Dr. Kruger. Chilly, isn't it? Oh, Mr. Briggs, you startled me. I didn't expect to see anyone here. Well, uh, neither did I, Doctor. Well, I suppose you want me to explain why I'm here. Mm-hmm. I want to believe Doug. We've worked together a long time. Anyway, I just had to come out here and check for myself. Check what, Doctor? For an entrance or an exit to the caverns he described. I'm afraid you're wasting your time. Have a cigarette, Doctor? No, thank you. See, we've already covered the entire area. We couldn't find a thing. 
Then, what about that scar? I'd like to see you disprove that. Oh, Mrs. Martin. Oh. How is he, Doctor? Oh, he's resting fine. I think he'll be all right. How's the car? Control yourself. And I'll call him just as soon as you get back to your room. Now you get back into bed and I'll call Dr. Kruger. Uh, I've got to figure something out before he gets here. Need a pencil, some paper, and a slide rule. I'll see that you get it. Oh, can I have Dr. Kruger, please? Dr. Kruger speaking. Oh, yes, Major. How is he? All right, I'll be over in a few minutes. Doug. as soon as I could. Is there anything wrong? He's much better. Imagine he's even started working. He asked for paper and a slide rule. That's interesting. Wonder what he's up to. Formulas, equations. Anyway, whatever he says, pretend to agree with him. Major Cliff's orders. Of course. Doug. Doug Kurt's here. Hello, Doug. In just a second, I'm almost finished. I'll take your hat. Thank you. Kurt, let's face it. I know that you all think there's something wrong with me. No, of course not. No, I, I wouldn't blame you after the story I told last night. Well, frankly, you did have us a little worried asking that a bomb be dropped because of what you said. You don't believe me either. Kurt, I tell you, I've been there. I've seen what they're doing, breeding animals into carnivorous monsters. But I don't need a bomb to stop them. I figured it out. It's all here. Now, look. Here's the nuclear strength of our last test. And this is the amount of electricity needed to control it. Let me see that. I had to estimate the conversion rates of their transformers. These figures are correct. Such transformers must operate on a constant supply of electricity. Where could they get that much electric power? Only one way. They must tap it from the main lines at the powerhouse. Could do it by parallel induction. Nobody would ever know the difference. All we have to do is to cut it off. Cut off the power? We can't do that. It would cause untold damage for miles around. Such a power stoppage must be planned in advance. Eight to ten seconds, that's all I need. That gap in supply will short out their resistors and the whole thing will go up. But you won't go along with that. No, no, not Doug, get back in bed. Oh, now there. look, you're carrying this out of my way. Doug! Please call the main gate and try to stop Dr. Martin. Doug took the car. Hurry. 
Dr. Martin. Stop! Stop! He did what? How long ago? Right, we'll leave immediately. What's wrong, Colonel? Dr. Martin. He's on his way to the powerhouse, wants to cut off the power supply. Well, let's go. I couldn't stop him, Doctor. He went that way. Switches. Come on. All right. 
cut that power. Now look, mister, be reasonable. I said cut it. Now the next one. Next. Go on. That'll turn the power off for a hundred miles. Do as I say. Here it is. Stay where you are. Put down that gun, Dr. Martin. I'm warning you, Colonel. Come any closer and I'll kill you. Now the next one. What's this one? That's the master switch. Cut it. Doug, please, don't. I said cut it. Get back or I'll kill him. Go on, get back. Go on, get back. Do as he says. Give me ten seconds after I cut the power. If I'm insane, nothing will happen and you can do what you want with me. But if I'm right... Now. One. Two. Three. Four. Five. Six. Seven. Eight. Over here. That's right in the button. So there you have it, another monochromatic movie marvel and really stupid. I learned absolutely nothing from this movie that I didn't learn better from other schlocky 1950s sci-fi movies. And you know, if there really were ten plans for aliens to take over the Earth, this was probably the tenth plan that was eliminated because it's stupider than the ninth plan from outer space. Also, this has got to be the most abrupt ending ever. Cut the power, aliens blow up, roll credits. No ending dialogue, no aliens melting in a laboratory fire. Did they forget that there were spaceships of aliens circling, waiting to invade the Earth? Was there going to be a sequel? Oh, I'm so glad we'll never know. So until next time, or not, this is Arachna of the Spider People, wishing you nighty night and reminding you that a slide roll in the right hands could save the Earth. This is it? Ground zero for the 1945 Trinity A-bomb test? 
I was expecting more. I mean, where's the museum? Where's the crater? Where's all the houses that were blown up that you saw in the newsreels? And I would guess that it's probably still pretty radioactive around here, although they say it's safe to be here. What, Dudley? The half-life of the plutonium-239 they used in the bomb is 23,000 years. You're kidding, right? Right? Oh, well, then maybe we should be going. Well, I'm not sure that was worth a trip. You know, we're out here driving around in the middle of nowhere in the desert. We should probably get gas somewhere if we can. Uh, and you know, Deadly, if we had an electric vehicle, and if you were right about the half-life of plutonium being 23,000 years, we could probably charge the electric vehicle on all of the radioactivity, right? Well, maybe not. Oh, look, there's a gas station up ahead. Oh, this looks like an original gas station from the 1950s, Deadly. Hey, there's no place to put my credit card. How does this pump work? Sorry, miss, I'm going to have to pump the gas for you. Uh, White Sands is only open two days a year for the Trinity tour and today's one of them and I don't want any tourists getting gas and driving off without paying. Okay, just like the old days, right? Do you know where the gas cap is? Yep, I used to have a car like oh. this. Wish I still had it. Yep, she was a beaut. You want to sell? No, I don't want to sell it, thank you. I didn't think so. Uh, that'll be 60 bucks, ma'am. $60? Pardon my pun, but that's highway robbery. Well, I gotta make hay while the sun shines now, don't I? Okay, here's my card. Okay. Here we go. You're in the middle of nowhere. It's not like you have any competition. Oh, but I do. I mean, ever since electric cars became popular, those illegal aliens down the road have this EV charging station and some kind of a weird roadside attraction called bug boxing. How stupid do you have to be to pay 20 bucks to watch bugs box? Illegal aliens? Well, they may not be illegal, but they sure look funny and they talk funny. And uh, they're breeding these gigantic bugs. That sounds illegal to me. Okay, mister, bye. All right, you have a nice day. Bug boxing? Boy, I gotta see this. Oh, look, there's a sign. It's up ahead. Deadly. That gas station attendant was right. That place is booming. Look at all the EVs, all the electric cars charging. Well, I guess it does make sense. If you're going to charge your car, you need to have something to do while it's charging. Okay, let's check it out. Two tickets, please. That will be $40 for the both of you. $20 each? That's really expensive. For bugs. You've never seen bugs like this before. Okay, I know this is a waste of money, Deadly, but I'm not giving them my credit card. They look really creepy. All right, here's 40 bucks. Okay, you can go in now. Bet big. Enjoy the show. Oh, that I have no good. Yeah, oh, it is. Stupid tourists. You know, Deadly, that gas station guy was right. These guys definitely look alien, but not like from another country, like from another planet. Oh, and were they talking backwards? That's weird. 
This arena looks like it's from a stock show. Metal bleachers, dirt floor. What am I saying? This is bug boxing. It's not like it's professional boxing or anything. Uh, let's look around. Stop. You're not allowed back here. It's not safe. Oh, uh, sorry. Um, we just wanted to see the bugs uh, before we bet on them, you know, to see how big they were and how mean they look. Yes, you must bet in order to pay for them. Uh, what do you feed them to make them so big? They get special power treatments. They're pizza and we need to be hot. Uh, uh, you ask too many questions. Take a quick look and back to your seat. All right, you guys, whatever you say. Come on, Deadly. And look out for bub poop. And is it me, or do all these aliens look alike? Those bugs are gigantic. But those spiders, oh, they don't look happy. I can see it in all 16 of their eyeballs. I sense spider DNA. Yes, I'm Arachna the Spider People, and this is my friend Deadly, and we came to see what bug boxing is all about. Please, you must help us. We are mutants, grown large by these aliens. The boxing matches are at front. When they're over, we eat the spectators. It is our only food. Ooh, that's terrible. How can we help? There is a back door. Please open it so we can escape after the match. Fighting is the only time we are not in these pens. The desert is our home. We want to go home. Uh, sure. I think we can do that. Also, cut the power to the EV charging stations. The aliens are draining power from the cars instead of charging them. They use the power for these electric fences and to zap our gross neurons to keep us big. Without that electricity, we will return to our normal size and the pens will open and we will be free. Thank you for helping us. Okay, Deadly. Let's go find a seat, and when everybody's watching the fight, you go open the door, and I'll go shut down all the power. Hey! Welcome to the Bug Boxing Championship of the World! Are you ready to rumble? Oh, these guys are serious. Who knew bug boxing was a thing? <laughs> uh, let's get this show on the road, folks. All right, in this corner, weighing in at 200 pounds, is Tilly the Terrible Tarantula. And in this corner, weighing in at 175 pounds, is Millie the Mangler Mantis. So now for round one, folks. All right, bugs. Come on in. Let's have a clean fight. No hitting below the belt, or well, no hitting in bad places. And when the bell rings, come out fighting. And may the best bug win. Oh no, folks. Looks like Millie's in trouble. She's down. But will she stay down? Oh no, she's down for the count. Oh, these bugs are fast and brutal. Oh, I can't watch anymore, Deadly. Okay, you open the back door and I'll go turn off the power, okay? And the winner and new champion is Tilly the Terrible Tarantula! Oh, Deadly, that's the creepiest thing I've seen in a long time. I'm gonna have nightmares about all those gigantic bugs and the bug-eyed aliens. But, on a positive note, the spider did win. 